Hi everyone, I'm Shaylin here with Reedsy, and in today's video, I'm going to be reacting to Stephen King's writing advice. You probably all know who Stephen King is. He is probably the most famous horror author of all time. One of the most successful authors of all time. And he does a lot of talks and gives a lot of advice about writing craft. You know, he has a whole book on writing called On Writing. I'll admit I haven't read it. So he is a well-known guy. Today I'm going to be reacting to some of his writing advice. So the clips have been compiled for me. I haven't seen them yet. I don't know if I agree or disagree. Um, I know some of you may be thinking, Shaylin, who are you to critique Stephen King when he's one of the most successful authors of our modern time and you haven't published a book? Well, that's true. He definitely doesn't need my approval. Just because he's more successful than me doesn't mean I can't have an opinion on what he has to say. So that said, let's jump into it and take a look at his advice. All right, so his first point here is on growing an idea. My method for starting anything is I tell myself the story when I'm laying in bed at night before I go to sleep. I'll I do that too. That's I don't do it as much anymore, but that's how I used to um, brainstorm stories when I was a kid and I wouldn't write anything down. I would just think about the story when I was trying to go to sleep, and I guess I had faith that I would remember everything. Tell myself this story. And so, at some point, probably nine months after this, because this is what it's like, you know, a little piece of grit, and it makes a pearl after a while. You just have to give it time, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't, but a lot of times it does. I really like that analogy. I think that's a beautiful analogy. I think it's very accurate, you know, not every little thought will turn into something beautiful, but if you give it time and you give it patience, it very well could, you know? Um, I think one of the biggest and most important ingredients in any book is just time. If you don't know where to take the idea, time. If the idea isn't clear and the plot's not all sorted, time. And it's like he said, it might turn into a pearl. So I think that's a beautiful analogy. I think it's very accurate. So the second point here is on ideas and notebooks. But People will say, do you keep a notebook? And the answer is, I think a writer's notebook is the best way in the world to immortalize bad ideas. I disagree with that, at least for me personally. I write down everything. And it's because if I don't, I'll forget it. Like, I can't keep all that in my mind. And I mean, Stephen King is extremely prolific. So I don't know how he keeps that all straight in his mind. But for me, I have to write it down. And for me, honestly, writing it down is very productive. Once I write it down, it starts to develop more. If I never write it down, sometimes it just stays a little underdeveloped, but for me, the process of writing things down, I don't, I don't keep it in a notebook, I just use the notes on my phone, I don't know. The more I write, the more it develops. So for me personally, I don't do that, but if that's his process, I totally get that. My idea about a good idea is one that sticks around and sticks around and sticks around. It's like, to me, it's like, if you were to put breadcrumbs in a strainer and shake it, which is what the passage of time is for me, it's like shaking a strainer. All this stuff that's not very big and not very important just kind of dissolves and falls out. But the good stuff stays, you know, the big pieces stay. Um, I had the idea for Under the Dome. I mean, I do think there's also truth to that, like, good ideas will just stay with you, you know? The little fleeting thoughts that maybe don't matter as much to you or you're not as interested by you won't think about them as much and i think with ideas i don't think ideas really have inherent value i mean sometimes you get an idea and you're like oh that's a good idea but most ideas the way to i think to value ideas is not based on whether they're good or bad objectively it's more do you care about it enough like does it interest you does it compel you if an idea compels you you're going to feel compelled to write it and compelled to turn it into something great if you're not as interested in an idea, you might not do that. And I do think, you know, time is a good test of that. If you're still thinking about an idea months later, it's probably stuck with you. For me, I can still write things down and the good ideas will still kind of reveal themselves, you know? I've written down tons of ideas and stray thoughts that never turned into anything important. I guess for Stephen King, he finds that not writing it down is important to test that. I don't find that they're correlated. Um, but I definitely do see the truth in that the more you think about an idea, you'll know if it's worth your time, right? Like, if you're still thinking about it months later, years later, it probably matters to you. 
uh, when I was teaching high school back in 1973, and it was just too big for me, and I was too young for it. And uh, I wrote about 25, 26 pages and uh, put it away. There's a scene at the beginning of this book where this woodchuck gets cut in half when this dome comes down over this town. I had written that part when I was in, um, in my early 20s and just sort of recreated it from memory when I, when I wrote the book. So the good stuff stays. The whole idea that some ideas are just too advanced for you is, can be productive, but also can hold you back. Like, it depends on the situation. I think there are times where you just know, I'm not ready to write this idea. Maybe I will be in a few years, but I'm just not there yet. And you want to wait, but also, Will you ever truly be ready to write something until you write it? Like, the only way to learn how to write a book is to write that book. You know, I can see, oh, maybe I don't have the life experience, or I need to do research, or the idea hasn't cooked long enough. Or maybe it's just a giant idea that's beyond my skill at the moment. But I, I truly believe that the best way to learn how to write a story is just to write the story. And it's true, if you know I'm not ready now, I will be eventually, then that's great to listen to that, like he did with Under the Dome, which I mean, that's like, what, a 2,000 page novel? Giant. But also, if you're just holding yourself back indefinitely from writing an idea because you don't feel ready, maybe you'll never feel ready, but maybe once you start writing it, that's the only way to feel ready, you know? All right, so this next point here is on language versus story. I'll, I'll give my thoughts pre-listening to the advice. I do think there are different camps of people who think language is the most important thing, people who think story and language are kind of equally important, and people who think story is more important than language. But I think for me, the way I see it is you can't separate the two. Language is how you convey story, right? So I don't think they're in conflict with each other. Like, it's not a language versus story, which one is better. It's how can I best use language to convey my story. So I definitely think they're both very important, but they're important because they work in unison, not because one should be prioritized. I don't think you have to prioritize one or the other. It's how can I use them together? So that's kind of how I've always seen it. And now we'll see what Stephen King has to say. The only thing you can do is you use your best judgment. Right off the bat, I completely agree with him. Writing, and I'm gonna quote a, a writing professor that I had who would always say over and over, writing is problem solving. And like, that's the truth, you know? There are so many problems you're going to encounter in your writing, and there's not going to be an answer for you in a textbook, in an article, in a video, in a lecture. The answer is just, you got to sit down and solve that problem. You know, every story is unique, every story is going to have its own unique problems, and I think willingness to write your story means being willing to just work through the problem. It won't solve itself, and oftentimes no one can teach you how to solve it. Beyond any other skill, I think, in writing, like, you can learn to use point of view and you can learn to write beautifully, but maybe the best tool in any writer's toolkit is just their better judgment. You know, and I want to tell stories, but I love the language. I always have. I've, I fell in love with, with books, uh, with novels when I was a young guy, and uh, I fell in love with poetry when I was in college. Uh, people like... Uh, Richard Wilbur, Hart Crane, uh, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, all, all the, these guys. Um. Poetry is great to read as a fiction writer. It'll show you how to use language so precisely, right? Like the thing poets are good at is saying so much in such a short piece. And as a fiction writer, that's a really great skill to expose yourself to. I always find my, po my fiction is better if I've just been reading poetry. The, the quality of the language being like something that you could eat with a spoon. I do love language that you can eat with a spoon. You know, like that intentionality, like he was talking about poetry. Um, I think what poetry, reading poetry and writing it also can teach you about fiction is how to choose every single word with purpose and care. And fiction should have that same care. And I don't aspire to be lyrical. I don't want to do that. But I want to write as well as I possibly can. I find it really interesting that he says this because I think a lot of people when they think of writers who are like language enthusiasts, who love language, who love the craft of language, they think of people with very flowery styles. They think of purple prose, denser prose. But Stephen King, I don't think he's known for that. It's like he says, he doesn't really want to write lyrically. He wants to write effectively. Like if you have a simple, straightforward style that takes just as much skill, it takes just as much care, it takes so much precision. And I'm saying this as someone who styles a bit flowery. I'll admit it. But I really admire people who can write quite in quite a straightforward way, 
because that takes a lot of skill. It takes so much precision. And I, I do think it's interesting that he's saying, yeah, this is the style I write in. It might seem a bit more straightforward, but it's straightforward because I care about the language. Um, I don't want to get diarrhea of the mouth. I want to keep the story rolling, but I want to do it as elegantly as I can. I think that readers sort of expect that. So, the, and then when the thing is done, uh, you give it to people, and uh, particularly an editor. And w one of the things I'm asked sometimes about editing, the more successful that you get, the more important it is to listen to an editor who won't let you hang yourself in Times Square. That's funny because I think, how many times have you seen books by like successful authors and it's like their fourth book and in reviews people are like, yeah, clearly not listening to the editor anymore. I feel like I've seen that a bunch of times. That's good advice. No matter how successful you are, never stop listening to your editor. So I try to do that and uh, I remember what Hemingway said, you must kill your darlings. Well, that seems a little bit harsh. I'm not able to kill all my darlings, but I do some. Next. I mean, kill your darlings, I understand the message, but sometimes if you love something, it's because it's good and you want it in the piece. You know, if a sentence is a darling, maybe it's because it's a good thing. Maybe you wrote a good sentence. You want to find a way to make it work. I'm the kind of writer who will go to any length to keep a sentence in a piece. Like, if I can't have it in chapter two, I'll find a spot for it in chapter nine. Like, I will make it work if I want the line. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's not necessarily kill your darlings, but repurpose your darlings. So this next point is about things not working out the way you're expecting. Well, anyway, I, I had a Honda because I didn't know any better. And, uh, <laughs> And I got it out in the spring when the snow was gone from Maine and, and I started it up and it just, it wasn't right. It just wasn't running right. And uh, somebody told me, well, you go on up to this guy's farm. He's got a, uh, you probably know where this is going. <laughs> uh, he said, go on up. This guy's got a little garage adjacent to his farm and he's got this unique way of doing things. He tells you what it's gonna cost and that's what it costs. So I went up, and about halfway to this farm, which was way out in East Overshoe, the, um, the motor started to skip. And uh, by the time I got to the farm, it was barely running at all, and it died as I pulled into the, uh, into the guy's dooryard. That's what we call it in Maine, a dooryard. So I'm on my motorcycle, and the motorcycle is dead. And from this garage, came the biggest goddamn St. Bernard you ever saw in your life. <laughs> and the guy came out, the mechanic came out, and the dog's going, Arr. and it's got that stuff coming out of his eyes, you know, the way that St. Bernards do. And he said, don't worry, Buster is very friendly. And Buster weighed about 250 pounds. And so I walked over toward Buster and his haunches just sort of coiled down and his teeth came out and he actually started to go for me and the guy brought a socket wrench down on his hind end and uh, the dog sat still and I thought I might get an apology but the guy looked at me and just said, Buster must not have liked your face. So he fixed my motorcycle, and I wrote a book called Cujo, and, uh, and it worked out. And sometimes, so sometimes it does, it does work out. Sometimes it works out, but it doesn't work out the way you think it's going to work out. Um, I wrote a book called The Shining. It reminds me of also something that I had a writing professor who used to say, which was, I don't remember exactly the phrasing, but it was like, if you pay attention, the world will give you ideas. And I feel like this is kind of an example of that, you know? He paid attention to what could be an idea and the world provided him with an idea. Um, did he almost get mauled by a dog in the process? Yes, but you know, maybe sometimes that's the price of a book that I'm sure won him awards and made him money. So it happens. I mean, he didn't really talk about a story not working out how you're expecting, but it's true. Like if you compare anything you've written to what your initial idea for it was. Like, compare something complete you've written to 
how you initially thought the story would go, it's probably so different, and that's not a bad thing. Um, it's actually probably a good thing, you know? Writing isn't always about creating exactly the vision in your mind. It can be about exploring the story as it goes, and it taking a turn you didn't expect is often the best part. And, uh... <laughs> Jesus, this is like being Led Zeppelin back together again. <laughs> Play all the hits or something. <laughs> That's kind of cool, you know, you sit in a room and you write stories and everything, and then you come out here and people have actually read the stories. It's, <laughs> it's, it's horny, it's good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I thought when I wrote The Shining, I said I had this wonderful idea about this family in this haunted hotel and what they really want is the boy with psychic powers. And at the end of the book, the hotel will kind of absorb him and then we'll see the next year, we'll see the whole family as ghosts, but it didn't turn out that way. I, I feel like you have to follow the characters and you have to follow the story where it leads. And the last thing that I want to do is to spoil a book with plot. So, you know, I think, I think the plot, that plot is the last resort of bad writers as a rule. I'm a lot more interested in character and situation and you'll follow it where it goes. And, you know, I got a lot of- Stephen King is the one who said it. <laughs> Don't ruin your book with plot. Wow, I mean, I might use that. Um, there's nothing wrong with plot. Interesting stories usually have compelling plots, but I think on its own, plot is not compelling. Plot is usually compelling because of the people in it. We don't really connect emotionally with events, we connect emotionally with people, even if your story is very plot-driven. Characters, though, we can connect with people outside of the events that they're in. So, I agree with him. Is it a controversial statement to some, perhaps? But I agree with him. And I think he's right, you know? If you know your characters well enough and they're compelling characters, you, you can just let them show you what the story needs to be. Trying to micromanage your story, I think, can lead to it feeling a little artificial. Usually, if you know your characters as people, if you know them as well as you know yourself, you'll know, oh, they wouldn't do that, you know? and they'll kind of take on that life of their own. And that's kind of the magical part of writing, I think. I know it sounds weird to talk to non-writers and be like, it worked out that way because it's what the characters wanted, but I think almost any writer can relate to the fact that once you've developed a character to that point where they feel real to you, they can almost act inside your mind as if they were a real person, and they'll go the way they would go, and they'll do what they would do, and you just have to observe it. Letters after Cujo because the little boy died at the end. Tad, his name was Tad, and he died of heat, heat prostration in the car. And I got a lot of letters saying, how can you kill that little kid? <laughs> Par parenthetically, I got a lot more letters about Greg Stilson kicking a dog to death in the dead zone. <laughs> People care about dogs in a way they don't about kids. It's, <laughs> It's weird, but there it is. Hey, I don't make the news, I just report it, you know what I'm saying? So, anyway, I had no idea that Tad was gonna die, and I had no idea that uh, Danny and his mother were gonna live, but I was really glad when they did. Well, I'm glad he was surprised. That is the fun part when your writing surprises you. Overall, I thought that that was really interesting. Going in, I really didn't think I would agree with him on pretty much everything, and I don't really have, I haven't had too much exposure to Stephen King's writing advice. I think because he's not a writer I've read that much of, I've only read a couple of his books. I've read Carrie and The Shining. And so I guess I had this notion that because we write very different work, I wouldn't agree with his writing philosophy. I liked his personal anecdotal approach. It never felt like he was saying, this is what you should do. It was just like he was saying, this is what I do. It works for me, take it or leave it. And I don't know, it just never, he never felt pushy, even though he is one of the most best-selling authors of our time, he clearly knows how to write the type of work that he writes very well. You know, even though he really does have that authority, I don't know, he still seemed just like a chill, humble guy. The only thing I didn't really agree with was that he doesn't write things down, which I have to write everything down. Um, but again, it felt like he was just saying this works for me. He wasn't saying you shouldn't write things down, just his personal approach. But yeah, I thought his advice was nuanced, it was funny, it was anecdotal. 
So that is all for this video. It was a really interesting one to make. So if there are any authors whose advice you would like to see me react to in a future video, please leave a comment below. And of course, remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos from us. We've got new writing, editing, and publishing tips every Tuesday and Friday. Until next time, bye.